If there's one thing that defines Americans, it's that we can't seem to stay in one place for very long. And major changes are ahead for the ways Minnesotans travel from one place to another. That's a subject we'll explore this week in a Dimension report called Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, a look at travel in the 21st century. And tonight, as we mentioned, the most busy night of the year at many airports, we start with a look at the future of air travel. It's become quicker, it's become safer, but not necessarily more comfortable. We sent Alan Cox flying westward to the coast for some observations on what we can expect in the future skies. Airplanes can bring out the kid in a lot of us. The sense of wonder these children show at the Museum of Flight in Seattle. Imagine the excitement passengers must have felt in 1928 getting aboard the Boeing Model 80A. It was a cloth-covered plane that could seat 18 in wood-paneled, corduroy-upholstered comfort. A far cry from the sandwiched sensation of modern jets. The people who made those planes tended to be an independent bunch. They pretty much made them the way they thought they ought to be made. Today, aircraft makers don't have that luxury, given the tight conditions in the airline industry. If the blueprints and the balance sheets work out, this could become the latest, fastest way to travel in the year 2005. It's Boeing's early, early plan for a new supersonic passenger jet. It could carry passengers from the Twin Cities to London in five and a half hours, compared with eight hours today. You may recall Boeing tried this before, in 1971, an attempt to beat the Concorde. Congress wouldn't give loan guarantees, and Boeing wouldn't go it alone. The only plane that ever got built was this mock-up, which today decorates the ceiling of a church in Florida. Today, Boeing executives say it's just as well their SST didn't get off the ground. The fuel crunch of 1974 might have sunk it. Even today, they're uncertain. Do you have a guess of how likely it is that something like this is ever going to get built? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure um, a betting line is really appropriate. It, I, I would say it's, it's, it's maybe less than 50-50 at this point in time. Already, designers are mapping out the landing gear, even though blueprints won't be final until 1998. And engineers face plenty of other challenges. A new SST would have to be as quiet on takeoffs and landings as today's new jetliners. It would have to be gentle to the ozone layer. It would need a network of cockpit computers to run all the wing flaps and slats needed to hit speeds up to 1,700 miles an hour. And so it'll appear to the pilot to be a nicely coordinated, very stable platform with a lot of automation. I think this will probably be the easiest airplane ever built to fly, tr commercial transport. And it shouldn't be that expensive. In today's dollars, 950 for a ticket to cross the Atlantic, compared with nearly 3,000 to fly the Concorde. Before that age comes along, this is the interior of the new jetliner for 1995, the 777. It's almost as big as a jumbo jet, but it's cheaper to fly because it has only two engines. It will offer the potential for a longer term, low cost of travel. Another new wrinkle, the wings wrinkle. The tips fold up to allow close quarters at increasingly crowded airports. Designers promise the quarters will seem less crowded on the inside. Maybe no more fights between passengers over luggage space. Of course, it's up to the airlines how many seats are jammed in on a plane. But by the year 2000, there's a promise of more in-seat entertainment. Boeing shows customers this prototype of TV sets in the back of every seat. I thought it was a little strange that the demonstration included the aerial dogfight scenes from Top Gun, but the people who buy jetliners must like it. At Northwest, they say this is kid stuff, only a hint of what's coming in the future. By the year 2000, the airline expects to offer a telephone at every seat. Passengers will be able to stay in constant contact with their offices, which sure takes some of the fun out of flying. Some people have criticized this uh, because they say that getting in an airplane is my one escape. The fact that your competitor, for example, may be in touch with their office and you're not will drive everyone to the, rea to the realization that this is going to be a fact of life in the future. Passengers will be able to watch newscasts and sports events live. They'll be able to shop from their seats and pick up what they've bought at the airport where they land. 
and video gambling while you're flying. Apparently, there's no law against it, although there is a problem if customers who lose big become rowdy and have to be kicked out at 30,000 feet. Some have bolder visions for the future. NASA is trying to drum up interest for a space plane traveling five times the speed of sound. It might carry passengers by 2050. Boeing engineers came up with these sketches of aircraft for the nation's tricentennial in 2076. The flying wing holding 1,700 passengers. It runs on fusion energy. The personal electric flivver, top speed 120 miles an hour. The electric commuter jet lands on the roof of skyscrapers. And the amphibian flies between cities and lands in a river or a lake. Most of us won't live to be amazed by planes landing in the Mississippi or atop the IDS Center, but maybe the next generation will. For Dimension, I'm Alan Cox. Tomorrow, Alan shows us... Tonight in Dimension, how technology in the 90s will change the transportation we use well into the 21st century. Last night at 10, we looked at air travel. Tonight, we're going to take a look at train travel. For a lot of Minnesotans, the romance of riding the rails is a love gone cold. Many of the grand old train depots of the Twin Cities are torn down or remain vacant. Some, like the Union Depot in St. Paul, still stand, but tonight the Union hosts customers of the trendy eateries inside, not travelers waiting for arrivals on track 11. And the streetcar rails that once crisscrossed the roads are now just ripples in the pavement. But rail transportation in our state may be back on track. Tonight, Alan Cox reports from California on the train of the future that may lure Minnesotans back to the rails. They painted them red like a Coke can to grab the customer's attention. They raised money, persuaded residents to pay higher gasoline taxes to build more of them. They say it's the only way to keep San Diego from choking in its own traffic. Trolleys are urban transportation for the future, they say. Trolleys, like the ones the Twin Cities tore out 40 years ago. A professional photographer shot these scenes in the Twin Cities in 1953, just before the tracks were torn out. Streetcars didn't carry riders where they wanted to go, the growing suburbs. Planners replaced rails and power lines with pavement. Like the rest of the country, Minnesota turned its back on the technology that helped build it. Passenger trains had been the gateway to settling the great Northwest. The Twin Cities astride the main route from Chicago to Seattle. Seattle was one of the places that tried to pioneer a new rail service, clean and quiet monorails built to carry visitors at the 1962 World's Fair. I remember coming to the fair as a child and riding the monorail. They said it was the way we'd all travel in the 21st century. But Seattle never built any more stops, and the train is still used mostly by tourists. For the most part, new technology was too expensive, so some cities turned to the past. They revived streetcars or built them fresh. San Diego inaugurated its system in 1981. Planners stuck with existing technology instead of exotic. Two. Today, buying a ticket can befuddle tourists, but helpers stand by. I find the directions confusing, but I guess that's just because I don't know San Diego. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the things that we, we're doing here. Financially, the San Diego trolley runs very close to breaking even, an impressive accomplishment for city transit these days. It takes only one person to run each train. Tickets are collected on a partial honor system. A conductor passes through about one train in four. And cleanliness is next to untimeliness. They're serious about keeping these trolley cars neat. They don't want riders to identify with a stereotype of a dirty bus. You can get a fine of $60 just for putting your feet up on the seat across from you. Aside from the slovenly, not everyone is sold on the San Diego trolley. Car drivers become frustrated by delays at crossings, which block some of downtown's busiest streets. If we have cars uh, stacked up, say, 10 cars deep at an intersection, and we have three to 400 people on a train, uh, I, I think that's a pretty good trade-off. I took the bus prior to the light rail. Buses got jammed up in the traffic on the freeways and everything. You don't have that with the light rail. There are no traffic jams. It's about 15 minute wait, but I don't mind it. I, uh, if you had your choice, would you use a trolley or would you use a car? 
A well, car? I mean, <laughs> give me a break. I mean, I'd, I'd use the car. That's the view of most San Diegans. In an area home to a million people, fewer than 5% ride the trolley. But that should go up when three new routes open. If trains can't fully replace the car, they can replace some planes. Europe and Japan lead in development of high-speed passenger trains. In France, bullet trains that reach nearly 200 miles an hour. In Germany and Japan, trains that float above the track on a cushion of air. State Transportation Commissioner Len Levine shot some of these scenes with a home video camera. What we're looking at here, standing on the outside just below the track, it's uh, the only noise you hear is the noise of the swoosh of the, uh, of the train. In fact, if you look up here, you'll notice the animals are not affected, the birds in the trees are not affected. Levine and officials from other states are sponsoring studies of a Midwestern bullet train. A possible route would carry riders from St. Cloud to Twin Cities International Airport in 15 minutes, then to Rochester in another 20 minutes, and on through Winona to Chicago. A study due next month will give the first sign whether the train can be built without large government subsidies. States would donate land they already own along highways. The cabin resembles the inside of a jetliner, the flavor of travel most people expect these days. And with greater speed, sometimes comes a trade-off in style. All aboard! In a way, something may be lost from much maligned Amtrak. We took it on one of its most popular routes, L.A. to San Diego. The train slowly rocked, passing by beautiful oceanside scenes. The pace is slower. No conductor on a bullet train is ever likely to let his daughter announce the next station. Ladies and gentlemen, our next stop will be San Diego. Trains can get us there, and maybe in an age of speed and automation, they can keep us feeling human. For Dimension, I'm Alan Cox. Tomorrow night, Alan concludes our reports on... On the next Inside Edition, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's bulging with success, but how did he get there? The higher, the best direct, the best camera people, everything has to be the best, and you pay for it, of course. For Arnold, it's as easy as... One, two, three, four... Plus, Hollywood's infamous casting couch. It still exists. What they're doing is they're playing on the desperation of these women. Inside Edition. On the inside, it's a whole different story. Inside Edition, Tuesday night at 10.35 on Channel 4. Tonight in Dimension, how technology will change the cars we drive. It's the last of our planes, trains, and automobiles reports. Traffic is moving slowly tonight because of the snow, but imagine if traffic moved that slowly every day on your drive to work. Planners say that could well happen as more and more cars clog our freeways. Transportation planners say the real cost of driving to the environment doesn't register with most people. That a gas tax of a dollar or two a gallon would drive home the true expense. But that's not likely to happen anytime soon, so designers are coming up with ways to make cars more friendly to the environment and friendlier to those of us who drive them. Alan Cox starts in well, freeway heaven, Southern California, for tonight's report. The bomb San Diego, very heavy through North Long Beach because Caltrans back up now is back to Crown Valley. Southern California freeways, the ones that carry the most cars in the country. White knuckle driving time for those of us who haven't seen anything like it. Unless you can imagine driving on Twin Cities freeways in the not too distant future. Federal study says that's our fate by the year 2005. Traffic congestion in the Twin Cities worse than Los Angeles is today. Maybe 50% worse. Imagine 15 years from now, hearing a traffic report like this. An accident westbound just past the flyover bridge getting onto 394, causing about an hour delay. Expect that if you're headed to YZ, Spaghetti Junction stacked up. Look for it to take you about 45 minutes to go from downtown out to Woodbury. That should begin to loosen out as usual by around 8 o'clock. And, of course, 35W. Heavy and slow, your trip time downtown Minneapolis to Burnsville, about 75 minutes. Dean Spratt, CCO Traffic. And that would be a good day in the year 2005. Planners say congestion is unavoidable as the amount of driving grows more quickly than the population and the Twin Cities keep sprawling beyond the suburbs. We don't want to pave all of the, of the Twin Cities. The car is a means, not an end in itself. And we want to try to leave some uh, neighborhoods and some places for people to live in the process. L.A. pointed the way toward jammed freeways. Now L.A. is trying to escape them 
with the smart car. 25 sedans are equipped with a dashboard computer. It can warn the driver about congestion on a 14-mile stretch of the Santa Monica Freeway. Each car reports its position to a computer at the Traffic Control Center for the LA Freeway System. It sounds like Hollywood. Have your computer talk to my computer. By January, the system should be able to do that and to guide the driver onto alternate routes. It looked to me like a wonderful gadget, but even the engineers who are trying out the smart cars admit it's a little tricky to read a map while battling traffic. Does it eventually become second nature? Not quite second nature, but uh, as you become used to where the buttons are, you won't have to really put that much, at, you know, focus that much attention to the uh, location of the buttons. And the test includes an automated voice passing along warnings. Westbound Santa Monica Freeway, congested from Crenshaw on to La Brea. General Motors will try an advanced version of smart cars in Orlando next year with computers pointing tourists toward hotels and other attractions. What we're trying to do is provide different means to alleviate congestion. And we don't want to just put all our eggs in one basket. But looking at LA's on-the-edge freeways and off-color air, some critics question the wisdom of encouraging people to stay in their cars. Morning rush on the Hollywood Freeway. About two-thirds of the cars headed downtown have only one person on board. L.A. commuters think little or nothing of an hour-and-a-half drive just to get to work. And one visionary for the auto industry says traffic tracking computers won't do much good. They're using my tax dollars for that. I mean, I have that now when I put my radio on certain all-news stations. Every 10 minutes, they give you a report. And, of course, in 10 minutes on an L.A. Freeway in rush hour, you might actually get, you know, half a mile or so. Bob Hall is the marketer behind one of the auto success stories of recent times, the Mazda Miata. He shows a playful spirit at the computer, but he has a serious message about the future. The cars will have to be made more fun, the way a zippy convertible is, without being made more destructive to the environment. It's maybe moving away from the idea that an automobile is a, a uh, technological terror that's just packing as much uh, new, new, new as possible into something and, and maybe sterilizing the experience of driving what little pleasure there is left in it uh, for some people. The future of the car in Minnesota can be seen today in California. This is a prototype for an electric car designed by GM. By 1998, California law will require 2% of all cars sold in the state to be electric, the kind whose drivers will say plug her in instead of fill her up. Solar technology is available for automobiles already. Engineers are trying to figure out how to lower the cost. If the L.A. experience is any guide, Americans will put up with plenty of sacrifice to stay in their cars. They can only hope for a future that keeps the freedom of the road and the sanity and health of driving the road. For Dimension, I'm Alan Cox. Now, before you drive out of town because of those traffic projections, realize that compared to other cities, it will be easier to drive here. By the year 2005, the city with the worst congestion, defined by number of delays per mile driven, will be Charlotte, North Carolina.